so much, George. Um, it's been, it's, uh, uh, you know, really excellent to be here today. Um, thank you to Estrella, who recommended me to <laughs> the to the group here at Garden Cinema. Um, and I just want to say these, these really are gems that kind of chart the cinematic expression of a majority of our world's population, right? Um, and capture the ways in which African filmmakers have brought new idioms, aesthetics, themes, production methods to this art ever since the, the first features were, were screened uh, on the continent in the 1960s. Um, so I don't, I'm, I'm not going to use this intro to, to spoil the plot, um, and I'm sure Sisse's aesthetics will speak for themselves, but I thought maybe it's a it, few of us, quite rightly, are probably familiar with the kind of film landscape uh, in Mali and in West Africa around this time that Sisse is working. So I thought maybe I could share a few, um, a few uh, bits and pieces from my own research, just so as we watch, we kind of both know why perhaps, as, as George said, the restoration isn't as pristine as it could be, um, and also get a sense of really the, the, the sort of resourcefulness and courage of the director himself, given we, we will know the conditions in which he was working as well. So Suleiman Sisse was born in 1940 in Bamako, the capital of Mali. Of course, 1940 under French rule at the time, independence hadn't yet come. Raised a Muslim, Sisse was a passionate cinephile from an early age. He attended secondary school in Dakar, Senegal, um, but then he returned to Mali um, in 1960 after its independence from France. Like it did for his contemporaries, Osman Semben and Sarah Maldoror, the Soviet Union provided Sisse with uh, a free filmmaking education at the Gerasimov Institute of Cinematography in Moscow. He came back uh, to Mali after that short stint of training and made some shorts and documentaries. Um, and eventually he produced his first full-length film in his own language, the Bambara language, a majority language in Mali, Den Muso, the girl, in 1974. The controversial subject matter, um, which criticizes the blame essentially that society places on victims of sexual violence, uh, landed him in jail. <laughs> so, uh, strike one, <laughs> uh, first feature film, there he goes. Um, but of course, at this time also, it's a little bit of a badge of honor <laughs> as well amongst many, many filmmakers and artists um, to kind of get on the wrong side of authoritarian post-colonial nation state governments. Um, and while he was actually in jail, um, he uh, began to obviously write, write and think about where his work would go next. But so from the outset of his career, um, he has been, he has positioned himself as a political director and like Semben with a special interest in the experiences of West African women. Next came Bara or Work uh, in 1978 and that won the top prize at, uh, prize at the most important film festival on the continent, uh, FESPACO, or the Pan-African Film and Television Festival of Ouagadougou in Burkina Faso. Um, I would definitely encourage you to seek out Sisse's other films, um, but many, as George said, are still unfortunately pretty hard to come by. Um, and as some of these challenges of distribution and restoration and presentation suggest, the very existence of Francophone West African filmmaking is political. So I thought I would kind of use this introduction to explain this assertion um, and why it's relevant to Finye. So French colonialism, it left behind a very particular media landscape in Senegal, Mali, Mauritania, and Cote d'Ivoire, amongst others. It was Paris controlled in uh, an economic sense more than in an artistic sense. Um, I like the way Malian filmmaker and scholar Manthea Diawara puts it, uh, technological paternalism. Mm -hmm. so there's a bit, there, a bit of a kind of paternalistic attitude that uh, France, even after officially leaving, uh, kept up in its relationship to culture in, in West Africa. So the French Ministry of Cooperation's Bureau du Cinéma uh, provided technical assistance to 80% of all black African film production in the 60s. And essentially it cultivated what it knew best, an auteur-led 
uh, kind of art cinema that singled out individual directors, right? Not necessarily an idiom or an approach that was decided by West African directors themselves. But this aid, um, as Roy Arms says, quote, existed independently from the commercial distribution system in Francophone Africa, which was under the joint monopoly of two French companies. So even after the official end of colonialism, France could nurture West African filmmakers, present them to kind of artistic minded metropolitan audiences back in Paris. But on the other hand, they could distribute commercial French and Hollywood films to West African audiences, a new market that was large enough to kind of cover Western mainstream cinema's high overhead costs. So kind of, it always works out for the French in this, in this setup, right? Osman Semben actually called this neo-colonial setup placed on directors like Sisse and himself a web of contradictions related to film financing and distribution so this shadow or trace of the work's kind of production history is, I think, encoded in each film. Finia is to say his third feature, but its script and screenplay were actually being worked out in 1978 and 9, so same time as the second feature, Bara. And, uh, it, and its delayed release was down to these, to these circumstances, right? To uh, changes in the French government's funding, um, the Giscard government decided it didn't want to finance films anymore, and then it backtracked. So this real sense of frustration was brewing amongst West African directors of being at the kind of mercy of these uh, these flows, ebbs and flows. So maybe as grateful as I am to the hosts for inviting me to introduce this film, I hope they won't mind me issuing a bit of a challenge to the blurb they've used on the website that Finier is a, quote, vivid social satire with overtones of Romeo and Juliet, which tackles the generation gap in post-colonial Africa, end quote. Western critical reaction to African cinemas has on the whole, I think, tended to either minimize the complex politics in which they engage by focusing as maybe the blurb, do blurb does a little bit on the universal elements of the, the storyline. In Finier, it's the star-crossed lovers, and the obstacles um, that paternal authority throws in their way. Or it has, on the other hand, treated African feature films kind of like sociological or anthropological documents, as though Africans cannot make universally themed films. So it kind of oscillates in this, uh, in this way between the two. The former approach really rests on, I think, unfounded assumptions that universal themes, everyday life, their aesthetic presentation is somehow apolitical. Finier is a great example of why this dichotomy is false. Francophone African cinema can always be understood as political because, as I mentioned, it's multifaceted interactions with French, global, and indigenous economies and politics, as well as with those conditions of distribution and uh, production. The latter kind of reinscribe those politics uh, in and around the film's making, right? So they reflect, in a way, the real inequities in our current world inherited from European colonialism. And interestingly, I think this dichotomy says a little bit more, this dichotomy kind of being aesthetic innovation versus political commentary, says more about Western mainstream cinemas, both art house and Hollywood, than about African cinemas, really. Euro-American cinemas tend to hide away the, the political and social context of their own making behind the, the valoriz valorization that's kind of timeless themes or human condition stories are the apex of cinematic expression. When we watch mainstream Western cinemas, those mechanisms of kind of global inequity in technical access, funding, and decisions around whose stories get to be told uh, and in which way, they tend to be hidden, kind of like good editing. You know, you, you don't notice it. And if you notice it, something is, seems to be wrong. Um, in contrast, West African filmmakers have this critical and probing relationship with African contexts that in this part of the world, and in our part of the world, could often earn the label of social issue film or political 
of film uh, rather than just film. <laughs> so I think, as Sisse said once, each film represents a certain history. Uh, and true to his word, Finier refuses to hide the time and place of its making. It captures a, a real mood of dissatisfaction, rebellion, and political change uh, in post-independence Mali. So I, I don't know if we, if we know much about uh, Mali, but essentially military rule there lasted from 1968, um, just countries fresh out of, out of colonialism, um, when General Musa Traore took power until 1991, uh, when mass protests led to multi-party elections. So our protagonist's story is, is incredibly historically rooted in this sense. Um, they are university student Batru and her boyfriend, Ba. Batru is the daughter of the brutal military governor, Sangare, who is an out-and-out -out Francophile. So, interesting commentary there from Sisse, not too subtle. Ba's father and guardian, Kansai, comes from a lineage of traditional Bambara chiefs and has kind of spiritual powers and beliefs. The two youngsters are, as per the title, the winds of change in this tale. Not only do they and their fellow students stand up to the military governor, but also to their own fathers and grandfathers. By defying, but I think defying expectations of social documentation, Finia also steps out of this plotline to communicate things beyond realism. So even though I wanted to talk about uh, and, and help us reflect a little bit on kind of what gets to be constituted as film and what gets to be sort of pigeonholed into political film as though everyday life isn't political, um, I wouldn't want um, that to detract from the fact that he is an aesthetic uh, master as well. I have not seen this restoration, so I don't know if it'll necessarily do it justice, but I think it does communicate things beyond this social realist story. Wind uh, and water are reoccurring mystical elements in many scenes where the camera kind of glides over a landscape that seems rife with spiritual power. Some sequences also figure Ba and Batru dressed in white, as in the poster, and a young boy in a white loincloth kind of fetches and serves them water from the river. So there's really sort of mystical and, and little explained aesthetic moments like this that communicate something beyond the register of, of social realism, essentially. Bambara symbols um, are also superimposed onto its panoramas. So events that defy that realism also sometimes occur. I'm not going to give anything else away, but Ba's uh, grandfather, Kansai, for instance, appears magically unscathed by a gunshot in one scene. So we'll recall that he had spiritual or traditional Bambara power. So there is definitely a parallel kind of morality, a parallel world, a parallel realism that Sisse uh, seems to be saying exists or coexists in parallel with the material world. Um, something that de we definitely don't encounter uh, in, in genre cinema in the, in the West. We, we, we're either going to get a fantasy or a social realist tale, etc. So we've got a lot of really innovative experimentation here that I think is trying to essentially communicate an African realism, um, which would be as ordinary as everyday occurrences to, to Sisse and his, uh, his uh, compatriots. That's essentially it with me. Um, I won't give away any more of the plot here, um, but I think all these narrative elements already begin to suggest how Finney complicates those two Western expectations around um, African cinema that I mentioned earlier. Um, universal themes versus didactic political critique, artistry versus social message. Um, <coughs> I'll stop there. Um, I hope these reflections have helped prime everyone's curiosity for the film and uh, looking forward to some <coughs> relaxed discussion afterwards. Thank you very much. <laughs>